Good morning. Happy New Year, everyone. This is the first Mortgage Coach No Borrower Left Behind interview of 2023, and it is the one and only Todd Books fan. What's up, Todd? You know, not much. I uh, feel like there's no better place that I should be than be here with you and our community to kick off the new year. I couldn't couldn't agree more, man. So I uh, I know this is a call you're very uh, excited about. I know you wanted to be the first uh, interview of 2023. So why, why did you pick this topic? And, and why was it so important to, from your perspective, to be the first interview of the year? You know, I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like we need to take a different direction in the community this year. I think we like, you know, my thing was leading in a different way this year for me. And then I think it overflows to, you know, to all of us. I feel like uh, everyone is saying that 2023 is going to be a hard year, right? You and I talked about it beforehand, right? Dan Rawich, I watched his uh, slides because I'm part of his group, you know, this morning. And he's like, oh, we're probably in a recession. We could be in a recession. It's going to be a tough year. He thinks the stock market will be worse this year than it was last year. You know, I'm in these other groups and all these people are talking doom and gloom. And, you know, me, I'm, a, I'm the eternal optimist, right? My kids bought me a hat and a shirt that says, you know, half full, right? My glass is always half full. And I always tend to look at things through those rose colored glasses. And what I want to do is I want to prepare um, and I want to lead as if it's going to be terrible. And I'm still going to hope it's good um, because I feel like if we're taking action, if we have the habits and the discipline that we need um, to be successful in what everyone views as a potentially really bad market, hey, if it's a great market, just think how much further ahead we're going to be than those who are just coasting still. Well, I did a lot of reflecting, planning, journaling, created a lot of content to kick off the year. And, and I guess when I say it's going to be a tough year, which I do think it will be another tough year, I say that from the perspective of the macroeconomics, you know, what are interest rates going to do? Uh, are there going to be more homes sold this year than last year? Uh, is it going to be easier to be a real estate agent or a mortgage professional this year? And, and no, I, I don't think it will be. Uh, I do. I, but, but could it be just the best year you ever had in business? Absolutely. absolutely. And when I hear of those challenges, like I watched Dan Rawlich's update yesterday as well. And yeah, I, I swear, I'm just going, oh, great opportunities. And, and the harder it gets for everyone, the bigger the opportunity is for people that really are willing to outwork other people. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm excited about this interview today is I can't think of anyone that has done a better job of leading by example. You, you heard that interview of Dan Keller's, which shout out to Dan Keller. Uh, it was the single most shared um, YouTube interview uh, in the community, over 350 shares. It was the most liked and engaged. And it was the second most viewed, only came in second to Scriptopalooza, which always is the, the number one. So shout out to Dan Keller. But you you watched that interview and then you took massive action. Uh, are, tell us where we're at on that whole journey of the 100 Calls of Day journey. Yeah, well, so what I loved about that was, you know, Dan said persistence beats talent every day in sales, right? So think about that. And and so, you know, I think it's kind of a perfect example. It's funny because I heard, you know, I didn't watch the interview when it happened. I, I saw the info on it, you know, a little bit later. And I thought to myself, like blinding flash of the obvious, right? If, if I'm going to prepare my team, um, you know, I've got a hundred million dollar team. They did almost just shy of 110 million last year. And I thought, you know what, my opportunity to help them is with business development in 2023. And when does 2023 start? You know, this was the beginning of December. I said it starts now, right? I'm not going to wait till January 1st to, to kick off the year. And so, you know, like I normally do, I talk without thinking. I said, awesome. Hey, I'm going to do 100 calls next Monday because that's when Dan did it. Um, not my ideal day to do calls. My ideal realtor call day is Thursday um, for lots of reasons. But, um, but ultimately, I said, hey, I'll do it. And then I said, you guys can all join me. I said, I'll just create a, a Zoom meeting room. You'll be able to see me call, right? Holds me accountable. Um, you can hear me call because I'll leave my, put my phone on speaker and I will unmute myself. And you can hear my scripts as I call realtors that I know, as I call realtors that I don't know. Um, and then you can all have your camera on and you can be part of it. And um, it's kind of what made me say I need to lead in a different way. I always love to lead by example. But the interesting thing was, is that it had about, you know, just shy of 50 people shine, sign up for the first week. Because I said, hey, again, I'm, I open my mouth all the time. I'll do it actually, not just one week, I'll do it for the next three weeks till the till the end of the year. And 
Um, you know, I loved it, right? I had all these people show up. We had, you know, 20 to 25 people on all day dialing alongside. About half would have their cameras on, half wouldn't. Um, but then what frustrated me was is that the next week we had more people sign up, but half the people show up. And then the next week we had even more people sign up and then half of the people um, from that time show up. And so it's this whole idea that um, we all have to take massive action if we're going to be successful in this market. And um, and so that's what I want to figure out is how do we then lead differently? Because my commitment going forward is, is that every Thursday, I'm going to call 50 real estate agents. Um, and I'll tell you, it was super successful for me. The first time it took me from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And I called 110 realtors to finally get a hold of 50. My, my really underlying thing was I wanted to have 50 quality conversations. I actually wanted to talk to real estate agents and hear what was going on and have a conversation with them. And it was really to me, pretty phenomenal. I mean, uh, it's always funny to me when you expect someone to pick up the phone and they don't, or the the, the opposite of that, when you, you when you don't expect someone to pick it up and they don't. Like I had the number one real estate agent in Maricopa County. He was number two in the country in 20, I don't know where he finished it up for 2022, but in 2021, he was number two in the country. He picked up the phone. Guess what? We're having lunch this Friday, right? Jason Mitchell, number one real estate agent in America. You know, I met Jason once, I don't really know Jason, um, texted him because uh, he didn't, his phone went straight to voicemail. I felt a little bit like a jerk because he was on his honeymoon. I didn't realize that. Um, and so I apologized to him next week. I sent him a text the next week. Hey, sorry for bugging you. I know you're on honeymoon. And sure enough, from his honeymoon, he texts me back and says, hey, let's connect when I get back. Um, so he and I have a call scheduled for this Thursday. And so the interesting thing is, is that oftentimes we're scared to make the calls thinking that they won't respond. And then ironically, I found that those people did. And then some of the agents who I know aren't very, I don't want to call them, uh, let's not say successful, who don't do a lot of transactions. Um, I expected they would be sitting around not having as much to do and they would pick up my call and guess what? They didn't. Um, and so it was just a really interesting um, observation. Number one, from the participants and you know maybe people didn't join the second or third week because they called on their own and they didn't feel like they needed the accountability. Um, but you know, ultimately in the end, I feel like that was opportunity number one is for people to engage and be part of it. And then opportunity number two is, is look at what your results were. Um, and so I'll get actually last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up for a sec is then the other part was, is the last week, um, you know, that whole um, Parkinson's law, right? That, that uh, activity expands to fill the time available. The last week, my wife was kind of annoyed with me that I was making a call. It was on the Thursday before New Year's um, and all my kids were coming to town. And so I said, shoot, I'll just do it in the morning. So I only gave myself four hours to make the hundred calls. Um, and again, that's why I use technology a little bit. I, I did um, uh, 72 calls and I did 28 voice messages, voice memos, and you know, mainly voice memos, a couple of texts and created conversation that way. Um, I talked to over 60 realtors that day, but I crushed it down into four hours. And so um, that was my experience with that one piece of uh, what I'm doing to build referral relationships in 2023. So let me get this right. You, you, did you make a hundred calls in that four hour window on Thursday? The, the, yeah, I made a hundred calls. I made 110 the first Monday. I made a hundred the second Monday. And then I made no, I'm talking the four hour. in the, the four, four hour, hour, I made 72 dials and then 28 voice memos that created conversations. So okay. again, and, it just depends whether someone like wants to call. Did you use a um, piece of technology? Nope. I used this phone right here and I used Siri, right? So again, if I had most of the time, the agents were in my phone. So that made it a lot easier and faster to call. Um, there was people on the first call, like Emma Dempsey out of Florida. He had phone burner. He cranked through his hundred calls like in two hours. I mean, you could certainly use technology to be a lot faster. Um, and then, you know, probably something I should look at for 2023. Yeah. I, hey, whatever, whatever works. I, I do know uh, from past interviews of Jeremy Forcier, he's used phone burner. And then he's also said, Hey, I need to slow it down and, and slow down the, the communication, uh, so, so guys, one thing I'm going to do, I, I had actually written a January post that I was going to post actually this morning, but I had a feeling that the conversation I was going to have with Todd was going to add to it. And so Todd and I are going to co-author this article that will be posted in the Mortgage Coach Facebook group um, by noon today. So by noon today, I will, Todd and I will co-author a post and it will throw out a challenge at you guys. And I can tell one thing the challenge is going to be from my position. It's make sure you follow Todd Bookspan like there's no tomorrow. You know, we've always had a very collaborative community. You know, the mortgage coach, now sales boomerang, no bar left behind community. But the win by new community is, is fire. And, you know, I can only speak to the just countless mortgage professionals 
that are that are like just sitting in a little, hey, I won by noon today. Like that metaphor of winning by noon, uh, I know a lot of people are picking like, hey, what's your one word? Uh, win by noon is three words. But by the way, guys, I guarantee if if you are not winning by noon, and that means getting a couple hours of prospecting in and doing a total cost analysis. To me, if you're a mortgage professional, uh, you have to be a data-driven mortgage advisor. You can't win without making at least two hours of prospecting. We just heard you can make almost 100 calls in four hours. And if you're not doing a total cost analysis every single day, guys, you're, you're not winning. You know, you know with the definition of winning by noon in this community is a TCA and at least two hours of prospecting by noon uh, as we head into the storm of 23. And, 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 and storm doesn't mean it's bad. I'm an optimist too. I just believe the harder the weather, the worse the weather, the bigger advantage I have. Like, it's just that simple. The harder it is for everyone else, the easier it is for me. Uh, so, so Todd, you picked this title. Um, it's really a two-part title, How to Build Referral Relationships. And I think you've already given us a couple tactics to do that. And then it was, and wealth building opportunities. So, uh, you know, why did you pick this almost two titles in one? What was the thinking on that? You know, the thinking was, I'm, I was looking for what are the two areas where I felt like people needed it the most going forward. And then, you know, also it sounds really, um, it's gonna sound really dumb, but you know me, I'm super transparent, is I always joke, like I get on stage and I'm talking about accountability and actually doing the hard work. And no one ever wants to talk about that, but everyone always wants to talk about growing wealth. And so I thought, you know what, it's something I'm super passionate about. It's something that I've been on a journey on for a decade, you know, after being flat broke after the financial crisis. And, um, and so it's just one of those things where, as I started telling my friends that I was going down these you know, path of, of really taking my wealth to the next level, people wanted to jump on that journey with me. So, um, so that'll be something, you know, let's, let's, we'll get to that one towards the end. So we'll kind of, we'll kind of seed it with that. But that's, that's really my, you know, my reasoning behind, you know, that part, but, you know, I still think it comes back to this idea of, you know, what's the message of the moment and, you know, to kind of frame it up to get people going, right? So, you know, we all know the definition of insanity, right, Dave, doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Right. And so I kind of feel like it's a little bit of reverse insanity right now, right? Your top 10 videos had all these, these scripts, right? Script of Palooza, Jeremy script, script, scripts, you know, realtor stuff, Jeremy, Dan, Shayla talking about working with realtors. Um, but I just don't see people taking action. So I feel like, you know, yeah, you could say that the definition of insanity is not doing anything and, and expecting a different result. But I feel like we all know what to do. And then we're just not doing it. So my example of that is um, Wilt Chamberlain, right? So I think um, Wilt Chamberlain, for anyone who follows basketball, they know who he is. But he was. But for those of you who don't know who Wilt Chamberlain was, he's Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain, right? The guy was seven feet tall, and he had. Um, he was known really for a couple of things. Um, number one was he was the first person to ever score a hundred points in a game. And then, should we say what the other thing he's known for, Dave? <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll leave it to you. All right. Well, he was known for it's your the, story, bro. Yeah. For he, there was a lot of women in his life. We'll just leave it. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but ultimately, he's known to be one of the greatest basketball players of all time. And I, I love this story. And I, I've only uh, I've used it in my coaching, but I've only shared it, you know, one time from stage. Um, but back on March 2nd, 1962, um, you know, Will played for the Philadelphia Warriors. Now the now the 76ers and they played against the New York Knicks. And um, something was different about that year um, for Wilt Chamberlain. So, you know, if y'all remember Shaquille O'Neal, right? So, so some of you don't know, remember um, Wilt, you know, y'all know Shaq because he's in all sorts of commercials if you don't know him from basketball. But really with Shaq, Shaq and, and uh, Wilt shared something in common is that they both were terrible at free throws, right? So you get fouled in basketball, you go to the free throw line, they call it the charity stripe because most people can get two baskets when they go up there to shoot two, um, but not, not Wilt, not Shaq, right? So if you wanted to get Shaq out of the game, um, you just, they called it hack-a-shack. You would just foul him because he would go to the foul line. He'd maybe make one shot if he was lucky. Um, so the coach would pull him out because they knew that that was not going to be uh, in their best interest as they got down there. And Wilt was the same way. He, he averaged um, during this time in the 40s 
percentages for free throw. So if he shot 10, he would maybe make four or five. He was at a 51.1% career free throw shooter. So he could make one out of two every time he got up there. Um, but 1962 was different. Um, 1962, he was actually shooting over 80%. He was shooting over 80% because instead of shooting free throws like this, like people shoot him, he shot it. I really can't show it, but like grainy style, they call it. He shot it where he picked it, threw it between his legs and he threw it up in the air. Um, and there's only one other guy who did that. His name was Rick Barry. Rick Barry was considered to be the greatest free throw shooter of all time. He's in the hall of fame. Um, and Rick Barry said, well, it's cause it's how your hands naturally go. They naturally can go like this, but they don't naturally go like this. Um, and Rick Barry might miss eight or nine free throws, um, in a whole season, uh, where like LeBron James will miss over 150 in a season. And so when you think about this, it's just kind of a basic of business, just like making realtor calls is a basic for us. Shooting free throws should be a basic, something that you get really excellent at if you're in, you know, the NBA. Most NBA shooters shoot, you know, 80, 90 percent. Um, but that year, Wilt Chamberlain was shooting um, underhand, granny style, as they call it. And, um, and in that particular game where he scored 100 points, um, he went to the free throw line 32 times. He made 28 wow. shots. Um, wow. And so, so he, he shot almost 90%. He shot 87 and a half percent. So if you think about it, the fact that he acted differently in 1962 and in that particular game, he shot a hundred points where if he would have shot 51%, he would have actually scored 84 points that day. And we wouldn't be talking about him. He still would be considered a great basketball player, um, but he would not have had the greatest basketball game of all time. And so the weird thing about it is, and the whole reason I'm telling the story is because the next year, Wilt went back to shooting 50 below 50%. And, um, and they said, well, why? And he said, well, I just felt dumb shooting that way. I felt weird. And so he wasn't willing to think differently again. He was going to give into pressure. Um, and so it, it's crazy to me. It's kind of that reverse def definition of insanity. His coach at the time said, we would win every single game if you kept shooting that way. But instead, he didn't feel good doing it. So therefore, he stopped doing what he knew that worked. And so my point to all of you is you all know what you need to do, right? You need to have better habits. You need to have better discipline. You need to come in the office and do the most important things first, right? Yeah, I'll say it, win by noon. Um, but the bottom line is, is that it's the reverse de definition of insanity if you're not doing those things. We know as a community, you proved it. Y'all watch the videos from all of our greats in the community. And the question I have is, are you doing it? Or are you Will Chamberlain? Are you not doing what you know you could do to be better? That is such a good story. I, 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 I knew the story, but I forgot the story. And I, I totally forgot. I didn't know those numbers, like 34, you know, he, he took 34 free sh for shots. Did not know that. So so here's what I'd ask everybody in the community to do right now. Like, I want you to write down what do you know you should be doing, but you're not doing it. Like, what is that one thing? And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, like, literally put this on pause right now. Uh, you know, one of the things I know I want to do differently, uh, we've created a lot of amazing content. I want to make sure we do a better job of letting you know where the needles are in the haystack. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna really double down on uh, my community.com mobile club so that I can send out the gold. You know, while I'm doing hundreds of interviews a year, over, over 200 interviews, over hundred loan officers, I wanna make sure the, the things that are the most important, that are the most valuable, I'm sending out through that community.com mobile club. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about, in a minute when I'm not talking, I'll let you know the number that you, you need to text. I want to do a better job of, you know, what are the one or two things in a 30-day calendar that I think loan officers should be doing and just do a better job of communicating on my LinkedIn profile on our Facebook group, really making it clear where, where the needles are in the haystack. Because this community that we have, we there's a lot of needles in the haystack. Obviously, the Dan Keller, which ended up being the most shared video, I didn't do a great job of promoting that, but the community found it, promoted it, 350 people shared it, uh, and it and it killed it. So, so what are you going to do differently? You know you should do it, but you're not doing it. If you are clear on that and you want to be so bold is to share that in comments, whether you're watching this in Facebook, whether you're watching this in YouTube, sharing comments. What's the one thing you're not doing? You know you should be doing. Um, so, so Todd, let's see, we're, we're about a third of the way through the call. 
give us another relationship building tactic. Obviously, you know, make it 100 calls, get your two hours of prospecting. Give us, let's just have three things Todd Bookspan thinks that loan officers should be doing. You want to win 2023, knowing that it's going to be a tough market. You're not going to have great microeconomics. By the way, that could change. Like it is possible that the recession hits, the Fed blinks, and rates come down. It's possible. But let's just assume it's not going to happen until the end of the year or next year. What are what are one or two more things people can do to build relationships effectively? Well, you know, it's funny that you said uh, to, that we should write down what to do, what you know you need to do. Because if you remember, Dave Galagos on Friday said you either um, don't know what to do or you're choosing not to do it. Um, and, you know, you and I both listened to that interview with Jocko Willink with uh, Andrew Huberman, and he just said, you know, basically, I just get up every day and I just do it. He doesn't think about it. He just does it. Um, and so I think the whole idea is you got to put yourself in the path of opportunity, right? We already laid out the videos where you can learn all these things. Mainly, you guys tell me um, when I'm talking to you, I feel like, Dave, our job is to distill what we're learning from these other folks. And then and then the one thing that I maybe do slightly different than you do is I'm actually going out there and I'm and I'm doing them myself. I'm trying them myself. I'm trying to figure out what works for me. I've got a different style than Jeremy. I've got a different style than Dan. I've got a different style than Shayla. So I'm also experimenting on it. Um, but you got to put yourself in the path of opportunity. So the, the next tactic that I would be doing, and it's something that we've talked about forever in this community, and I'm shocked that more people don't do it, is a quick uh, one to two, three minutes top video every week to your real estate agents. And then let's just sort of talk about what the ideas are, because it kind of goes into the third idea would be, is you got to put yourself in the path of opportunity. Again, call reluctance comes because we don't feel like we know what to say. Go back to Dan's call, watch it. I'm not going to give you the scripts on that because Dan did a great job. Jeremy, Shayla, they did a great job in those videos as well. But, but what I would be doing is a weekly video. And I would just be thinking about how to mix that up. And then I would be thinking about the idea number three, which is you have to invite them to something, right? Something where you can get face to face with them. And again, it's not a brand new earth shattering idea that you've never heard before. But the question is, is are you doing it? And if you say, well, I tried it once and I didn't do it. Well, then the question is, are you doing it? Did you do it consistently? And then the, the last part would be is, well, then even if you did it before and it didn't work, why don't you try it again um, now? And so for me, what I would be doing, so in my um, operating system 2.0 group coaching group that I did last year, and I'm getting ready to launch another group, um, January, whatever, next week, I think it's the 10th next Tuesday. Um, you know, I did a weekly video for them. And so I actually did a weekly video that I sent out to real estate agents here in the market. And then I posted the video and I said, here's the two or three slides or here's the website I was sharing. I did all stuff for the most part that was free that people could find out there. Um, and, and think about what the message could be. So haven't done my weekly video this week because I was preparing for this call, um, but I'll do a video this afternoon. And my guess is that my video is going to be something like, hey, it's Todd Bookspan with the Bookspan Baker team. Happy New Year. Hey, I wanted to let you know, here's how I'm feeling going into the new year. And I'm going to talk through just what I walked through here before. This whole idea of of opportunity, right? Is it, I'm going to work hard because it could be a terrible year. And if it's a great year, then I'm just going to kick even more ass. Um, and then I will say, awesome. Hey, I'm going to follow back up with you next week. Um, and I'll ask a question. Hey, what else is it you would like to know? So that's probably my video, super short, super easy, just me and my smiling face. Um, what else would I be doing? And what else did I do over the last quarter? You know, I took some of Dan's slides and I showed a slide of Dan's. And then again, I would typically Google it and find a free resource so I could share it with people because I didn't want to give away Dan's stuff to other loan officers to use. Um, you know, again, you can do the boring stuff, interest rate updates. You can do the boring stuff, program updates. But I was literally using the, the slides from the mortgage coach community, the stuff that, that people have come on here and shared with us, right? So I used Dan's slides, actual slides when Dan came on and, and Dave and I interviewed him and he gave us slides. You know, we had KCM come on. Um, David Childress gave us slides. Guess what? And I stole a couple of his slides. And it's not like a 10 slide presentation. It's one to three slides where you just take a minute and you explain the slide, you take it off screen. Um, but ultimately it's getting in front of the people and then sharing with them on a week in and week out basis. Um, because ultimately all you're trying to do is set up what your next call is. So if I send them a, a video text Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, when I call them on Thursday, it's a super easy opportunity to say, hey, Dave, did you get my video yesterday? And Dave's going to say yes or no. And I'm going to say yes. no. If he says no, I'm going to say, well, here's what you missed. And if he says yes, then I'm going to say, awesome. What did you think? And that's it. I'm not going to tell him what I thought because I already told him what I thought in the video. Um, and so all I'm trying to do is create engagement. 
Um, and then you're going to do the Gary V jab, 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 right hook. And then you're going to figure out what it is you're going to invite people to. Um, and so the other thing that I did was, again, because I speak without thinking oftentimes, um, is you're going to figure out what is you can invite them to, right? So there's tons of different things that you can do. But what I chose to do was create a mastermind. Um, I feel like there's no better opportunity, especially in today's market, than to get smart people in a room and where I don't have to be the star, where I can ask two simple questions in a 60 to 90 minute conversation is what do you see as the biggest opportunities in the market? And what are you seeing as your biggest challenges in the market? And so um, I sent out a video, again, one of my weekly videos, awesome. Hey, I wanted to invite you all to a mastermind. Um, and I set up the mastermind here in our office um, and I got people to come to the mastermind. I ended up with 14 people that came to the first mastermind. And uh, we did it where uh, people could be in office or coming on Zoom. I don't really love the Zoom piece, just FYI, but you know, just one of those things, our area is big and, and people ask for it. So we did it. Um, ironically, it was, it was successful. Most people showed up in the office and we had some really big producers, right? People doing a hundred million down to you know, a, an agent who said transparently her ch biggest challenge was not knowing whether she would survive the market. Um, and it created an amazing conversation. Um, and guess what? They all are like, hey, can I invite my team members? Who else can I bring to the next one? And so it's going to continue to grow as we go into 2023. All right, guys. So I took a number of notes. Uh, to me, I, I, I really feel like what Todd just painted, you know, the, the prospecting, make lots of calls, uh, you know, do a weekly realtor video where you're teaching an idea or a strategy. And you're telling a story, you know, story, strategy that's going to help them sell more homes. I loved the monthly masterminds. Uh, personally, I wrote down, I was, I was trying to think of like, what are three things that if a loan officer did these three things, they instilled these three habits, um, that what would they win? And, and one of the habits is two hours of prospecting. Uh, and make sure you're calling your database alerts within that two hours. So when I interview the best loan officers between eight and nine, any alerts that are coming from their database, any insights from Sales Boomerang are part of that two-hour calls. If they did one to two um, TCAs before noon, like we got to have a win by noon there. And then one thing I added, Todd, is, and I, I do this, I have built this habit, but daily text videos. You know, like if you just, for every app you took, you attached a 15 to 60 second video. If you had a meeting with a realtor and afterwards you said thank you with a 15 second to one minute video. If you just every single day, you you did some videos and then those weekly wins, boom. What are, you, what are your thoughts on the, the, the three that I came up with though? No, well, I think it's like huge, I mean, three? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're 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 spot on, right? I mean, I know there was a video a couple of years back with Josh Metal where he talked about doing the videos as a follow up when he takes a loan application, and you know, think about it. Yeah, you'd like to say that you meet with a lot of your clients. Yeah, you might think you meet with a lot of your clients on Zoom, but I don't think that's probably the case. And there's nothing better to build relationship with a client or a realtor than this, right? Face seeing a face because they see the look on your on your they see your smile, they see your look, like how serious and how passionate you are about it. So I think that's a huge win. There's no doubt that the TCA piece is it. And I think it's the whole idea of, you know, we, again, it goes back to, we all know what we have to do to be successful. You know, how do you get there? It was inching in, uh, you know, I listened to the David Goggins interview that Joe Rogan did. And, you know, D David Goggins is just such a badass. I mean, the guy's like barely walk, but he's running 20 miles at a time. And some people might think he's insane, but, you know, he's just one of these people who just, he's going to overcome any non-believer in, in any doubt out there. And he said, you have to clean out your mental garage in order to have discipline. And I thought that was kind of interesting, but I sort of look at it as you, Dave, every morning, right? I see on Instagram stories, that you're, you know, you're at your favorite coffee place, you're down there by the marina, you're out walking along by the ocean, right? You are cleaning up your mental garage um, as part of your discipline so that you go in your day and get all of this stuff done. And so I think a lot of that too, then is you as a loan officer being organized enough in your day, in your habits, right? You know, that whole idea, show me your habits and I'll show you my life to make sure that when you get in in the morning, you can execute on these things, right? I mean, that's a basic, but you know, I do find that that's where I see a lot of loan officers missing it. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So guys, we're at halftime. I'm gonna pivot the interview a little bit because I wanna, I wanna hear some wealth building opportunities, uh, but I do wanna really push you, if you're watching this, you know, what are the three 
daily disciplines that if you did these three things by noon, uh, 2023 would be a winner for you. And regardless of how close you came to your personal production goal, you were proud of yourself. You know, you, you, you're like, I was clear. I had these three habits. I implemented them, you know, over 90% of the time. What, what are those three habits for you? Please, if you want to share, share. But most importantly, just take, take some notes for yourself. So Tom, we are at halftime of this, uh, this interview. And I really want to get into wealth building opportunities because for over a decade, you've, you've been smart with your money. You've invested in real estate. Uh, you've invested in stocks and bonds. Uh, you know, you've, you've invested as an entrepreneur in, you know, a small business, which will hopefully become a large business. You know, what, what are, what are some of the things you're going to do when it comes to building wealth and, and also as a leader, you know, you're, you're, you're going to help the mortgage professionals do more than make a lot of money. You're going to help them build wealth. So what's the, what's the game plan, brother? Well, I mean, let me kind of give the backstory of it, right? So, I mean, I grew up in a household. I always considered myself the poorest of the rich kids because I went to a, I, I grew up, my dad was an attorney. My, my mother was a teacher. Uh, my dad was super cheap. He still is. And my mother spent money like it was going out of style. Like the old joke was, you know, when you had a checkbook, she was like, as long as she had a check in the checkbook, she had money. And uh, my mom as a school teacher got her paycheck deposit in her account. And she spent all that money on me and my two brothers. So we did feel like we were okay. Like I had polo shirts at school, like all the other kids had polo shirts, but you know, mine were from Marshall. So like I had the neon green, which wasn't cool, you know, didn't sell at, at the other stores. Um, but I felt like I had, you know, I was okay. I felt like I had money. Um, as an entrepreneur from an early age, um, my aunt still jokes that I tried to sell her my skateboard when I was like 11, so I could get a, uh, get a better skateboard. Um, and so she figures I'll sell anything to anyone, which I guess is probably true. But, um, but so I grew up kind of conflicted on, you know, on money. Um, but I did go out and get a job pretty early on. I went to a private high school and ironically, cause my mother was a teacher, I was there on scholarship. Um, but you know, again, I called myself the porch of the rich kids because everyone there was pretty stinking wealthy, but I was the only kid in high school that had a job. I'd get on my bike after school. My mom had it in our van over at the, you know, on the campus uh, where the lower school where she taught reading. And I hopped on my bike and I rode to the bike shop and I worked, I worked after school. So I had as much money as my friends, but it was my money versus, you know, their, their parents' money. Like my friend, I uh, won't mention his name, but literally for his birthday, he got an American, corporate American Express card for their you know, for their company that was sold for nine figures, uh, you know, so again, a little different, uh, a little different upbringing when it, you know, when it came to, to money. And so I think I kind of grew up warped. Um, you know, someone recently said the definition of poor is it's something you're born into. Um, but broke is when you have access to money and you screw it up. So I feel like I was actually broke for a long time. I had access to money um, and I screwed it up. And I kind of thought that's why I want to talk about it to loan officers. Um, you know, I went to a wealth event um, at Keller Williams with John Downs at the end of last year. And I asked John, because we were in a group that I thought was a pretty high-end group with, uh, you know, coaching group. And I said to him, how many people in the group were wealthy? Like meaning that they had assets versus just big paychecks, right? Because, you know, a, you know, a lot of us at that time were making, you know, good money. You had to make a significant amount to be invited to be part of the group. But you know, there weren't that many people who had a ton of assets. There were some mortgage company owners. Yeah, guess what? They were they were pretty wealthy. They owned a mortgage company. They had a big asset. But these other loan officers making five, six hundred, a million dollars a year, a lot of them just don't have assets. So, you know, first off, look at yourself and look at everyone around you. Um, and I realized that for my first eight years in the business, that's kind of where I was. Um, you know, I, I was making good money, but I really hadn't built a whole lot. Um, I, I got kind of lucky along the way. Um, and so for me, you know, really that's, you know, yeah, I bought rental properties and I think that that's, you know, Dave, obviously it's what we talk about in this community, right. Is help people build financial wealth through home ownership. And we've talked about that for years. Um, my question is for you loan officers, have you done it for yourself? Um, I mean, wh what do you think, Dave, the percentage of loan officers that we talk to, like, we know Josh has property. We know Wally has property. I mean, we know the people who have some property, but do you feel like it's a large or a small percentage of loan officers that are making quarter million dollars or more a year that have good true wealth? Mm, I mean, it's, I don't actually know the percent and I don't want to put anybody on the spot here. So I'm not going to, you know, start having people um, share that unless they want to share it. But it's, I mean, it's far less than 50%. And my guess is it's less than 10% of mortgage professionals, regardless of how much money they make. 
have, have really um, invested it in a way that they have residual income coming. They have income coming in um, regardless of whether they do their job or not. And, and at the end of the day, that is something that, you know, we at Mortgage Coach and Sales Boomerang, our, our whole strategy is everybody can achieve financial freedom. Uh, you know, clearly the more money you make annually from an income perspective, the faster in theory you can do it. But we, we do want to create more awareness on how to achieve financial freedom, whatever that is for you. Um, but let's just say for the sake of your answer, it's less than 20%, you know, the, the Pareto principle. And my guess is it's a lot less than that. It's probably 10%. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of my guess, too. And, you know, what I felt at the time was is that nobody actually just smacked me up across the side of the head as the financial crisis was coming and said, hey, Todd, are you doing the right things? And, you know, I think we've talked about it in this community, right, cutting expenses. We started talking about it more than a year ago, you and I, on the Friday Masterminds. Um, you know, but for me, I owned rental properties, right? So I did own five rental properties going into the financial crisis. Um, and, you know, those, those five properties in 2000. 10 were worth negative half a million dollars. I was worth, you know, it was just crazy. I was, I was probably worth negative. I don't know the exact number, um, but it was somewhere in the eight, nine hundred thousand dollar negative range that I was worth in, you know, 2010. And, you know, I say these things not to um, embarrass myself, but I'm, a, I'm embarrassed by it. You know, I mean, I literally bought my house in 2010 with 5% down. I literally got paid on a whatever day it was. And the next day I closed. So I had enough money for my 5% down. Um, and then literally the meet with the contractor and he'd be like, Hey, I need this much money. And I'd be like, Oh, awesome. I can pay you on Friday. No, and I got paid on Thursday. Um, and I worked my way out of, of being a uh, negative net worth and a positive net worth by, by making better financial choices, by, by having better financial discipline um, and making some strategic choices, most of them around owning real estate um, and then investing in other areas. Um, so, you know, I bring up my story um, you know, not to try to impress you, but to impress upon you that it's little changes that you can make today that I think a decade down the road can give you, you know, a significant um, net worth. And so, you know, my goal is, is to speak more in the community. So again, full disclosure, one is, is I'm, I'm part of a group that's called Be Wealthy. It's Brett Tanner, who spoke at our first modern, more, modern real estate summit. And his video there was, on uh, how his kids are going to be worth like three quarters of a billion dollars by the time they retire because of seller financing properties. Ironically, it wasn't our most popular video, but it was my favorite. Um, it was D Dave Gallegos's favorite um, because when I when I talked to him about uh, what I'm doing with Brett, um, you know, Dave was like, "I'm in. How do I get in?" Um, and uh, so, full disclosure, I've teamed up with Brett Tanner. We're doing Be Wealthy LO, so we're actually tacking on a loan officer version of his Be Wealthy group. Um, it's not for the faint at heart. It's five grand every time we get together, fifteen thousand a year. Um, I haven't. We're we're just piloting it in February. I've got three people coming. Ironically, Dave Gallegos. Uh, and the bird and the nerd, um, Denise Donahue and Deborah Bird are are joining me. So we have I've got spots for two more people. So if you're interested, at some point I'll have Robert throw up my link tree. There's a little form you can fill out. Um, but then I'm also going to work with Brett on a a lower cost monthly subscription service where we give out information to you on growing your wealth for just a smaller fee. Right? It's it's going to be pay to play. Um, but I'm really passionate about helping people get there and. Um, and so that's really where, you know, that's the path I'm going on. Now, the other piece of that is, is what kind of got me on it. I, I joined Brett's group actually last March is when I joined it. And then he also did, a, he's doing a version where he teamed up with Gary Keller and it's called KW Wealth. And I did that with John Downs and I've talked about on a couple of these calls. And my favorite part about doing it with John Downs was one is it forced me to get away from Phoenix for a couple of days. Two, I got to hang out with my buddy, John. And three, I got to brainstorm with them was how can we use this to build our business? So it kind of goes back to the building referral relationships. Um, so what John did with the information was he took a couple of the tax strategies that they taught there. So we spent uh, six hours at over two days at, at one of the events in Texas with a tax strategist. And he laid out all these different strategies that he said that these real estate agents should do to save money. Now, for me, they didn't all apply to me because I'm a W-2 employee, right? They wouldn't apply to you for being a W-2 employee. But what I loved about it was is that John took action and he took two of the strategies and he, and he asked big real estate agents in his market who followed him on social, but had never connected with them and said, Hey, have you heard about these rules? And they said, no. And he said, Hey, um, would you like to learn more? They said, yes. And so he was able to use the strategies he learned about growing wealth 
And he was able to use that to teach realtors because guess what? Just like you probably want to know about how to be wealthier, um, these real estate agents want to um, be wealthier as well. Ironically, Dave, the number one strategy they gave for people to um, increase their wealth from a tax perspective was the ERC, right? The um, the things that we're doing here in this community with uh, Bill Hillestead. So on that link tree link that is in here, there's a thing if you want to learn more about the ERC stuff. And Dave and I are committed to bring uh, more of that to you guys, because transparently, that's one of the ways I'm going to build personal wealth in uh, 2023 is by referring people to get their employee retention credits. Love. Well, I think we're going to need to hear a little more about that. Um, so we're now almost through the third quarter. Uh, we're about three minutes till the fourth quarter of this one hour uh, mastermind goes. Uh, we put a link to Todd's uh, linked tree uh, link, which, by the way, I saw that. I've, I think Deborah Bird's been telling me to get one of those for a long time. And I am going to have one of those link tree links, Dave Savage, I don't know, something we'll think of some cool link for that. So stay tuned for, for my link tree link next week. Um, so Todd, anything else from a high level perspective, the advice you have for any loan officer watching this, that um, they want to be wealthy. What's the Todd? I, I mean, I have one piece of advice that I want to close this part with, but do you have one to do, you know, we've given them a couple to, to do's to build relationships. What are what are one? What's one to do you have for everyone? And then let's um, you know spend the fourth quarter doing Q and A with the with the group and talking about ERC. Sure. So let me give my one to do, and then let me give a couple of. Um, well, then I'll let you give yours, and then let me give you a couple of tactical ideas and other things that I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about growing my wealth. Um, I think the number one to do is you need to have a, you need to be tracking your wealth. I mean, you got to track your wealth. I've actually done it since I was poor. That's how I know exactly what my negative net worth was, you know, 10 years ago. But if you're not tracking it, I used to track it on a quarterly basis. And um, Brett now has me tracking it on a monthly basis. It's a little bit painful, right? I own a lot of properties. I now own 27 properties. So not as much as some of these other wealthy people that we have that are on as guests. Um, but, you know, to go in there and go, okay, my house is worth this much and my mortgage is worth this. Um, you know, and, and looking at, you know, at all those things, but it's, it's pretty eye opening when you look at it on a month over month basis. Um, and so that would be where I would start. I think you got to start there. It makes me kind of think of Jim McQuaig's old four step cash flow priority model. If you're like, Hey, Todd, this is way out of my league. I can't even think about it. I'm already struggling, right? His, his four step cash flow priority model, which is what I used to teach all my clients. It's kind of what you're probably already teaching them, right? One is pay off all your debt other than your mortgage, right? Two is to have however months, typically I tell clients three months of, you know, money in the bank. If you're self-employed, maybe six months. Um, and then number three is save to invest, right? Save for good things and bad things. So save if you have an emergency outside of that three months and then, Hey, looking for an opportunity, right? So, you know, like I bought a house and in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 35,000, the cheapest house I've ever bought. Um, I'm going to use seller financing that I learned at the Modern Real Estate Summit. We're actually getting ready to put on the market uh, this week with seller financing. I'll make about a 20% rate of return on it on an annualized basis going forward um, once I do that strategy. Um, but ultimately is, is invest for good and bad things. And then he always said pay off your mortgage, but that was by having that mortgage offset account, by taking the money that you would have normally used to prepay your mortgage and then have enough money in that account so that you can pay off your mortgage. So um, so I think it just starts tracking your tracking your your wealth. And so again, that's going to be what do you owe and what do you have and what's your net worth? What's, what's your one thing, David? Well, before I share my one thing, if I had to ask for you, would you be willing, and again, you're not having to do this exclusively for the mortgage coach community, but would you be willing to commit to once a month, uh, you know, creating a short, like less than 10 minute video and a post with Todd's wealth tip of the month? So absolutely. And obviously you can share that in the win by name community. You can share it anywhere, but I would love to like make a commitment that 12 times this year, Todd is going to, you know, by the 15th of a month uh, is going to share his wealth tip of the month. You cool with that? I'm totally cool with that. It's actually part of the be wealthy LO piece. Cause you know, when someone joins that, they're going to get all what they do in Brett's group, but then I'm going to create content specifically for the loan officers in the group to 
um, go out there and be able to teach it, give them the done for you content to get it out there. Um, and part of the reason I'm only having five people to the first group is because I want their feedback of what they really want. I know what I think I want as an LO, but I don't know if it's what they what they really want. So um, it'll be kind of fun to hear what their you know their feedback is. I know Dave doesn't really care what I have to talk about. Well, he does a little bit. He really wants to learn all you know all Brett's uh, you know crazy strategies. But yeah, absolutely, I will commit to that. All right, awesome. So my my one thing is, and really that's going to be two because it's one for what you should do, which is document in a paragraph, what does financial freedom mean to you? You know, uh, And I'm not even gonna lead you to how to document that, but I just have a paragraph. What, what does financial freedom mean to you? And then the, the part two to that is add that to your discovery calls with your clients. You know, I've always felt one of the most powerful questions you can ask a client when you're, you know, every other loan officer is gonna ask, oh, you know, what are your goals? Uh, you know. When, how long do you think you're going to have this house? Like every loan officer asks that. Not every loan officer asks, how old do you want to be when your home's paid off? They don't all ask that. Uh, or, and, and based on this loan you're getting into, how old are you going to be? You know, so that you can really uncover, usually it's a five to 10 year gap between what they want and what they got. But but start asking people, hey, what is what is financial freedom mean to you or you know what what are your goals from a financial freedom standpoint you know when when do you want to achieve that what does it mean so let's let's learn what that means let's ask that question more often but let's just start with ourselves and document it and i did document that for myself in 2020 i you know um, got really clear on what was my five-year vision what was financial freedom to me uh you know like my story that I wrote for myself. And I've been updating it every year, but I wanna push everyone in the community to, to document that. So so Todd, we got um, 12 minutes left. Uh, I think it was, I don't know if it was a month ago, you, you talked about how you were going to local business owners and financial planners. And it was just part of, you know, how you're adding value in your local community by talking about ERC credits. Um, you know, kind of update me on the story, update us on how that's going and what that means. Some people might just be for the very first time hearing the words ERC in one word. Yeah. So, so on the link tree link there, right, toddbookspan.me, you can, there's an ERC link in there that'll link you to a couple of videos, a video that you can share with a business owner and a video that you can actually watch to learn in depth about the ERC credit and then how to earn money referring it. Um, the reason that I was excited about it when I called Bill Hillestead, who you all know as the smartest guy when it comes to marketing in this community. Um, but Bill, when I called him about marketing, he's like, oh, Todd, I'm not doing that right now. I hand that off to my to my daughter and her, her fiance. I'm focused on this ERC thing. So I did a lot of research on it because Bill was so adamant that this was a great opportunity. And so because I care about people, just like I want to make you wealthy, I care about the business owning clients. Um, that I have. And so ultimately, I viewed it as an opportunity to do a few things. Number one is to help any business owner that I know. Um, as long as they had at least five W-2 employees in 2020, 2021, they're potentially eligible, eligible for up to $26,000 per employee. Um, and um, as a true tax credit back from the government, um, up to 500 employees. So I've got some people in, in this community who've referred over their mortgage companies that they work for. Um, the mortgage companies had, you know, one case the mortgage company has 200 employees, right? They're potentially going to get a few million dollars, right? They could get $4 million, $5 million. There's some different factors that kind of come into play. Um, and ironically, this loan officer could get like a 30, 40, $50,000 commission for referring over, uh, literally for putting the person's name and phone number in a form, um, you know, they're going to, they're going to earn a commission as it goes through. And, um, and so really, it's just a great opportunity for number one, you to help a business, um, number two, for you to potentially get paid. Um, so I guess those are those are two good pieces about it. And I've just tried to make it easy through um, putting out content that that you can sign up, and you can share the content so that all you literally, you don't have to be the expert. You let the video do the selling for you. Love it. And, and, and what about just tactics for loan officers and realtors? Because when I heard about this, I was just thinking, what a, what a great excuse to call you know, financial planners, to call CPAs, to call every business owner in my database and, and make sure they know about it. You know, um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Like this month, 
if you it's are, a no brainer. Are, are you doing that? You know, it's a no brainer because we have call reluctance and, and it's one more thing that you can call someone and tell them about. Right. So if you're like, Hey, Todd, I thought your mastermind idea was, idea was stupid. Why not call a realtor and say, Hey, do you know anyone who owns a business? And they're going to say, yes. And awesome. Hey, would you like an opportunity to call them and be able to share with them how they might be able to make, uh, or maybe you'll get a tax credit for up to $26,000 per W-2 employee. And I always push it out with the realtor's W-2 employee because they're all like, I have five employees, but their employees are all their team members and they're all 1099. Um, and so you, you technically didn't have to have uh, five in order to uh, get the ERC, but you had, to have, you had to have five to use the high-end accounting firm, really the top accounting firm for this in the country that, um, that our referral network is essentially the marketing funnel for. And so, um, but a perfect example is, you know, got a, a loan officer out of California, he signed up as a referral partner, and then he signed up his CPA as a referral partner. So they actually pay you down the next level. So if um, if you refer your CPA, they'll get the 1% uh, referral fee, and then you would get a quarter percent referral fee. Um, and so the number one refer we have to our network is a CPA, and um, he's referred over about 20 clients, uh, four so far, I think have gotten uh, money, uh, you know, submitted for the money. As soon as the as soon as it gets submitted, even though it takes the IRS three to four months uh, to get the the money to the to the business owner, um, because of the fact that the accounting firm has a hundred percent record of getting all of their filings through uh, the the group that we work with advances fifty percent of the commission up front, um, and so. Um, so as people add up other referral partners underneath them, you're actually getting a smaller referral fee, but still a referral fee when they refer. So it's this whole idea of, of uh, what do they call it? mailbox money, Dave, of, of getting this other money. And I'll tell you, my team finally referred their first client, per, first person over. It was a client of the teams. And apparently they reached out to the team for a cash out refinance, 70 grand in credit card debt, drowning in it. Of course, credit scores busted. Uh, they don't qualify because of the, too much debt. And um, they're, their ERC just got approved last week. Uh, I think they're getting 50 grand or 60 grand. So they're not getting all the money that they need, um, but they're getting a huge chunk. I mean, for someone who just owns a garage door business, this is just a game changer for them. It's changing this person's you know, current financial state by, uh, by the loan officer, just saying, hey, let me refer you, let me refer you over. So, um, so yeah, I think it's a super cool opportunity, Dave. All right, guys. So we put a link to Todd's ERC8 links and uh, dude, just appreciate everything you're doing for our community. So we're we're in the last five minutes of this game. You know, what do you make want to make sure people hear? What takeaways do you have? You know, how do you want to close this out? All right. So let me just, here's my quick sales pitch. Everything I'm selling is on the link tree. So Deborah Bird and I are launching a building referral relationships um, product. So check that out. Um, we're doing a webinar on it next week. And, you know, really it's just going to be how to give you ideas and social stuff to make you, uh, make you build, make it easier for you to build those relationships. Um, launching again, my, my operating system 2.0. One of the things you and Dan talked about was the perfect loan process. And what I would tell you is, is that, you know, there's two things that matter that you actually know how to approach your day and build out your ideal week and that you have a perfect loan process. That's what I teach in the 10 week course that uh, launches next week. Um, and it's the cheapest coaching course that I know of that's out there. I think there's a lot of great coaches if you can afford a thousand bucks a month or more, but this one starts at 99 bucks a month, depending on what your production is. Um, and then it's got all the ERC links on there. So I guess I would throw that out there, Dave, as I want to make sure I do that. And then I think really it's just a matter of you know, go to where we started, right? I said that I want to lead in a different way. So personally, for me, if there's anything else that you all think that I can do to add value to you in this coming year, you know, let me know. I feel like I've got, you know, at least my wife would tell you, I've got 87 things that I'm really passionate about and that I'm working on this year. And I've really tried to narrow it down to the things that I think will help loan officers be most successful and grow wealth as we head into the year. And, um, and I'm excited for it, right? I mean, I'm going to be transparent with on the wealth side of the things that I'm doing to grow my wealth um, so that people can hear about that because I, I, I want it to be inspiring. I don't want it to be something where people are like Todd's a jerk because he's talking about those things. Um, I'm going to continue to push loan officers who are struggling to be better um, and, and do that by having better habits and disciplines. And, um, and I'm continue, I think with you, Dave, I feel like what we bring to the community is you know, I'm not going to have the top 10 video every time. It's always going to be Shayla, Jeremy, Dan. It'll be Scriptapalooza, which is obviously us. Um, but we do such a good job, I think, of distilling down that information and making it actionable for everyone here. Yeah. Well, guys, my word of the year is is value. I, I uh, 
when I landed on the word advice early in my career over, you know, 36 years ago, my advice makes a difference. It, it was a tactic and a strategy to be valuable, be valuable to borrowers, be valuable to referral partners. And, and so for the first time in 36 years, you know, I'm going to make my word value again. How can I be more valuable to mortgage professionals, more valuable to real estate professionals through mortgage professionals? I have, you know, I'm super clear that the mission, you know, my business mission is to change how people get into debt. And, and advice is the weapon, you know, being a data-driven mortgage advisor. Uh, so one thing I would ask, if you've ever got value from this community or any of the content I've created, you know, please help share that content. When there is something that's super valuable, uh, whether that's a sales meeting, share it. Uh, I, pu I put out the, the top 10 mortgage coach videos, the top five megatrends. I will be talking about these megatrends all year long. Uh, when I came up with these, I looked at, you know, what are the top 10 videos? And then I looked at one of the top 20 videos. And then I looked at like, hey, who are the $100 million plus producers? And even in this market, they're doing 100 million. And I'm like, what are they doing? You know, what are they doing to win? And guys, their data, you know, we're in this new era. And I'll talk more in future calls around this new era that we're in. But I really do believe in my 36 year history as a mortgage professional, or no, is it 33? Whatever the number is. I'm forgetting it right now. Uh, a long time. It's, it's a long time, but rates have gone down the whole time. And so that was a big shift, just rates coming down, call it like a sea change. Uh, also technology came out and that was a sea change, but guys, we've hit the bottom. Rates aren't gonna go lower than 2%. And so now that we live in this new era where rates go up, rates go down, you got to be an advisor. You got to have data. You need to turn your database into a data bank. Um, anyways, I'm not going to go through all, through all of these, but I just want you to make sure you scan this, you study this, and, and you share these videos. Whichever are the most valuable videos, make sure you share them and give them a life beyond just today. You know, this interview with Todd Todd, super grateful that you were my first interview of 2023. Uh, you know, it's time for both of us to go to, to the next level. Uh, I know for me, that means we're, you know, being a good leader, let you know where the needle in the haystack is with all the content we create. Todd, if there's one closing thought you have, or when, when you say, I'm going to be a different type of leader today, um, what's that closing thought and what does that mean to you? Well, my word is going to be intentional. And what, what I think is, is that there's not an area in my life where I can't be more intentional, right? I can be more intentional around my morning routine when I wake up. I can be more intentional when I get to the office about the things that I do before I allow other distractions to get in. I'm being more intentional about what I say yes to and what I say no to. And um, and so when I say leading from a different perspective, I think it's just going to be a little more in people's face, right? I'm never going to be the, you know, I'm never, I can't reach through and, and grab you up by the, you know, the collar or the, or the throat and tell you what to do. But I think I got to point out the reality this year. I've always tried to be the nice guy and encourage people along, but I've, I've said it, you know, over the years that you have to sometimes rub salt in the wound to kind of get people to, you know, to wake up. And so oftentimes what I find is, is that, that we spend so much time now, granted, I think I agree with, with what you said earlier, Dave, you've got to spend time intentionally working on growing yourself. I mean, I feel like if you're not spending an hour a day right now, consuming content, reading books, you know, doing the other things that you need to do, but then you've got to take action. So um, I love that value is your word of the year, because I know you thought it might be action, but I think that that's what you've got to add on there. So intentional action, take the action, because in the end, if you're going to do this, watch this video like you just did. Thank you for doing so. Uh, but now you got to go take action. And so before you get distracted by something else, before you jump in your email, right, who are the people that you can call? Who's the video text you can send? What are the things that you can do to make sure that when, when we get to the end of the year and you're writing down your, rev your review, you're thinking about what went well and what didn't and what you can do differently, that you have a little bit bigger smile on your face than you might otherwise have? All right, guys. Well, this is day three of 2023. Get after it, guys. For everyone that tuned in all the way, we appreciate you. Uh, if you got value from this, give it a like, share it with your friends, and uh, talk books back. Let's have fun playlists this year, brother. Heck yeah. 
All right. Cheers. Thank you all.